Yes. So instead of showing you that later, I just showed you a little bit about it now, but I'll try to screen capture the details with that um, because part of the process is then stopping that recording, saving the recording, and then editing it. So we will do that in just a little bit. And I'd love to address all these questions. Um, unfortunately, some of them are questions that I haven't answered yet. So here's my in introduction. Um, STAT 200 and STAT 250. I don't know, whenever I tell somebody what I do for a living, I get that awful face. Ew, you teach statistics. I hated that class, right? So teaching statistics and, and the way to teach it is something that I've always been interested in. Um, I didn't really get my PhD in statistics. I'm more interested in educational psychology or a way to get through to students. Um, but I never pursued a PhD because I got too involved teaching at Penn State. So I slid right into actually teaching. And we had these issues. Um, when I did student teaching in high school, about 30, 35 students was what the teachers complained about. That's such a large class. What do you do with all those students? Um, 300, 350, 1,000. I have never taught 1,000 students at once, but in a given semester, I have 500 different students. So having those issues and, and having students come to you and say, I really want to do well in this class, but this is what's holding me back. The large classroom we all know is an issue. And I don't know if it's an issue that we're ever going to get over, but it's something that we obviously have to attempt. Um, I also like giving students instant feedback. Let me scroll over a little bit. Our resolution didn't match completely. Can you guys get all of that? OK. Um, so when you're interacting with students, um, they want to know how they're doing right on the spot. So I was really quick to use Angel and online quizzes for like homework questions or uh, I give quizzes on the reading. So they have to read the textbook and then there's a quiz they have to take. Uh, I give them a couple of attempts to try to make sure that they get it right because that instant feedback I think is something that's important. But at the same time, I'm not going to have a large class of students all with computers in front of them. That's not where we're at yet. Um, but office hours are my favorite. Teaching in office hours is the best because you can see those aha moments. One-on-one -on -one is what I would love for us to be able to get, but how do we do that in a large classroom? So the two courses that I teach, STAT 200 and STAT 250, are essentially the same, except STAT 200 is four credits. They're supposed to meet four times a week, and it's for non-science majors. Uh, STAT 250, if I scroll over just a little bit, three credit, credit course, it met three times a week, um, and then... Um, what we had in our department, the Department of Statistics, Bill Hartman created this awesome teaching philosophy that students are going to learn better uh, if they're more involved in the classroom. And obviously, that's why we're all here. So instead of meeting four times a week in STAT 200, over here, we're meeting three times a week, once in a large lecture room like forum building, uh, and twice in a lab classroom where they're broken up into smaller sections. Um, and then they had one hour on their own, which was an online quiz. So when I got thrown into teaching STAT 200, that was the mold that I had to follow. I also got thrown into teaching STAT 250, so I did a similar thing. Instead of having three lectures, we had a lecture, a lab, and then a lecture. So the labs were smaller, 60 to 80 students, and then I had a couple of them in a row back to back. Um, and for me, the way that I was teaching STAT 200, one lecture was enough. I was able to cover one chapter in 50 minutes. I did it really fast because if you haven't noticed, I talk really fast when I get excited about something and I love teaching and I love statistics and you just put the two together and 50 minutes is like two hours for somebody else. So the third um, class meeting when we were back in the lecture room, I would go over homework examples because I believe that students learn math problems by going through the steps themselves. Now getting students in a large classroom to answer questions, it's worse than pulling teeth. So that completely wasn't working. I'm not the only one teaching STAT 200 right now. Um, so without flipping, what we did now is we incorporated that fourth class meeting is now a lecture meeting. So we meet two times in a lecture hall, two times in the lab. Um, but some professors that have been teaching during the time that I was, you know, we had that outside credit that students still took an online quiz or something. So some people cancel that. Um, right now when I'm flipping the classroom, as you can see down just a little bit further, I cancel this one right here. And that's where my students need to watch the video lectures that I have previously captured. They watch them and then they take a quiz. So I spent an entire summer and even more than that um, in my home office talking into my laptop alone, recording my lectures in a quiet setting. When I recorded the lectures during the classroom, there were a ton of 
Um, what was it? Those the, the desk things that they have, you know, in forum, the desks that flip out and then they clank back in and then students drop their calculator and it goes down a couple of rows and then everybody laughs. All that stuff was in my recordings, so I had to redo them so that it was more quiet. That was fun, especially when the software fails. Um, you can see that I'm using OneNote. If you copy and paste from Word into OneNote and you start editing and like writing on it and then erase it, you know what it does with the text? Has anybody seen this? It squishes it, right like that, one letter per line. So my lectures were now forever long, but OneNote can handle that because OneNote, a page just goes on forever. But uh, one, one recording, Brian walked in and, and found me crying on, on the sofa, and I was like, I can't do this, I can't do this, I need to throw my computer out the window, but I didn't because I love her too much. Um, so let me go back up. And then the 250 class, um, the only person teaching 250. So this structure right here. That's, nobody's doing that right now. Um, I think if they assigned a TA to take over the course, they'd probably do that because that's the way that they set up uh, in the registrar's office, the classrooms that are going or happening now. Um, but in working through what I'm doing in 250, I don't have to fit the mold in 250. 200, I have to fit the mold because there's 20-something sections of it. But for 250, it's just me. So the lab classroom, they use statistical software and um, do a lab quiz. And that's the homework questions that they normally would have done outside of the class. And then and taking a homework quiz outside of the class. We do that in class now, so students have to come to class. The outside of class is where they watch the lectures, and there's nothing canceled over here in 250 for them to have that class time to watch lectures. So I try to make them only work on questions during class. The traditional questions that they would be working on their own, that's what we do in class, except nobody has written those questions yet. I'm awaiting uh, five entries in a Dropbox for next Monday's class. The students are creating those questions. I made my study guide into a little piece of paper that I could cut up and hand out to students. So they're creating those questions now, and hopefully they turn them in on time. Otherwise, I have to come up with them. Is there required questions? Yes. Um, what's going on with the clicker questions is they'll earn a certain number of credits uh, or points for the semester for answering the clicker questions in class. But the only reason that they will actually get those questions is if they attempt to submit a question for the rest of the class to use. And I'm still getting volunteers in my last class. Students come to the front and volunteer. I did send out email reminders that for the first time uh, on Monday. You haven't completed a clicker question yet. You need to do so before the end of the semester. And then I had, I don't even know how many, more than ever, I think I filled up to like two weeks before the class ends of students ready to, to do those clicker questions with those topics. Um, I personally, however, please don't hate me, I don't really like the clicker method in terms of learning. Uh, I like the STAT 200 method a little bit better because um, in the lab classes, yes, they're using computers to turn in their work. But in the lecture class, they're actually coming into lecture. And they sit down and they work on the sheet of paper. Uh, it, it looks just like any normal sheet of paper. And it has questions on it. And they sit there and they work through it. With the clicker questions, uh, most of the students are sitting there with their book closed, no notebook open. And they just press a button. And then they're playing games on their cell phone. I did learn about a couple new um, social games from my students while I'm walking through the classroom. Because uh, they're not as engaged as I would want them to be. So I really like this part better in the STAT 200 um, because they take the time to actually write them down. So th this is my favorite class to go to because although I'm in forum building and I do have to walk up and down those steps repeated times, you know, students are working on a sheet of paper and I can see them working together with other students, asking other students questions. How did you get this? And if they don't get it, then they ask me. So it's the same thing that we do in the lab classroom with walking around and having the interaction, except we're in forum building. Looks like a lot of work that's been on I have TAs for that. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the hand grading for that assignment. Um, but I'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, I've had this one TA actually request to be with me for the past four semesters because he's good with that assignment and he likes doing that. So my hopes are probably your hopes. Um, we get students engaged. We give them examples to go over. And we get to know them a little bit better. Um, that whole one-on-one -on -one thing is very important to me. Issues and concerns. Oh, did I tell you already? I posted this on my blog. If you're having trouble reading it or if I'm going too fast, you can always review the notes uh, after the fact or the recording after the fact as well. Um, my fears, though. Um, 
In the beginning of this semester, I thought I wasn't going to have a job anymore um, because some students were calling it an online class and they didn't think they needed to come to class. Even though I have in-class assignments every day and that's part of their grade, 10%, 15%, almost 20% if you add up those quizzes as well, um, the quizzes that I restrict by IP address so they have to come to class, uh, still some of them see it as an online course because the lectures are posted on Angel um, and they just think that they need to watch those lectures and then don't come to class. I think I have 20% of students that I don't know because they don't come to class. And unfortunately, those are going to be the 20% of students who aren't going to get good grades because they're missing out on all of those uh, grading assignments. Um, this one. The difficulty of the course is now the fault of flipping the classroom because I don't stand in front of the class and give lectures. Uh, that's something that I'm constantly concerned about. Um, and this one. Anyone who knows me knows that my students love to complain about me. I don't know why they don't do that with the other professors, but for some reason they think that if they go to my boss and complain about how awful I am, that I'm going to have to change and give them or hand them a grade. Um, so I do get the most complaints in my department. Um, so I'll go over how my boss has reacted to this. I just wanted to let you know that was my concern. Jenny, yes. Can you feel better? Me too. Okay, good. I'm not alone. You're not alone. <laughs> Second and the third actually just happened. Really? Yes. Organic and I can tell them, organic is hard. Yes. Uh, statistics is hard. You have to work at it, right? So, yes. yes. So it makes you feel better. Thanks. Hugs. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to flip your classroom, the first thing that you need to decide is how you're going to develop the content. The basic idea behind flipping, which I haven't really said yet because I expected you to come with that information, uh, is that you're not going to give them their first exposure during the class period. You want them to see that beforehand and then they come to class and discuss it. Uh, dwell more on it, dig deeper into it, and apply it in real life settings. So um, you may ask them just to read the textbook. I don't know about you, but most of my students don't read the textbook. They think it's a worthless $100 that they had to purchase because the homework questions are in it. Right? Um, one other thing that I thought about, class time might not be the best time to learn. Uh, how many students come to your class after taking an exam? They're useless. Or what if they stayed up all night because they have an exam right after your class? They're even more useless, right? So having these recordings or getting the first content outside of class gives them an opportunity to prepare themselves to actually take in the knowledge when they want to take it in. They're not forced to come to your class and have to learn it for the first time then. So I also was able to look at the difference between just recording the lecture during the class and posting it uh, as opposed to completely flipping it and just having the lectures uh, outside of class. Um, the only problem is, by the end of the semester, so a year ago this time, it started dwindling, and then it got worse and worse. The last, or I should say, the two weeks before the last two weeks of the semester, I had zero to six students show up for my class where I was recording the lecture during class and then posting it online. Most of them got used to just watching it online later and they didn't bother coming to class. So I don't know, maybe they didn't want to see my face or maybe they didn't really care, but whatever it was, it wasn't working because I was the only person there. So we talked a little bit about the process. Um, I did have to choose a PC, uh, touch screen tablet, because part of my presentations during class used statistical software Minitab. Minitab is not available for a Mac, so I was forced to have a PC in that. And the Lenovo ThinkPad was the best thing of its time. I remember getting online um, with the Lenovo chat person saying, I want to record my lectures during class. I need a PC. I want it to be powerful to screen record and for me to write on it at the same time. And the technician said, oh, one of my professors is doing that. And then we just instantly fell in love, and this is what I ended up with. Um, so I love it. It works great. The things that I have to use with it, um, Microsoft Office OneNote, I'm too cheap to buy 2010, so I'm still running 2007. Um, but I hear that the updates in 2010 didn't change any of the problems I'm having with the 2007 edition, so everything's good there. Uh, Camtasia Studio 7.1 is the most current edition of the Camtasia Studio recording software. Um, so that is what we are currently recording the screen with right now. So let me just show you a little bit about that. Uh, when we're done recording, it's just going to ask me to save it and then process it. Um, so the area of the screen at the bottom is your timeline. That's where you will see the entire video. You can cut it 
uh, copy and paste, edit it out, fade in, fade out, whatever you want to do. What I normally do with my videos is chop them so that they are only uh, 10 minutes or less. And then I post that on Angel for students to view. So all of my lectures, if they were 50 minutes long, that's going to be five pieces or five parts that students need to watch outside of class. Uh, the great thing, too, while you're screen capturing is that uh, you can edit it. The black part that says Camtasia Studio, that's where you actually see the recording. So you can move the timeline and see it change, uh, have it play back. And if you'd like to add any other clips, uh, the white area allows you to add music or pictures, photos, anything with different layers. Uh, so the editing software for me, I figured out how to use it on my own and using the support that they had in the online help. It was pretty intuitive to me. Uh, also, as you can see in this recording process, this window stays open as well, so you can pause. Uh, one of my classes, the phone actually rang, so I paused the recording and answered the phone, and it was a wrong number, so I hung up and I started the recording again. Worked great. Now, do you, are you able to um, uh, have a screen of uh, closed caption on it? Have you tried that? I have not tried closed captioning on it, um, but you can add little text pop-ups. So actually, I think I guess I did that for um, the elevator clip for this session. Uh, I had text that appeared on top of the screen. So if you're screen capturing and you have enough white space, then you can just put the text on top of it there. But yes. There's, there's something that, that they add into mine that I'm using. To, does it do it automatically? It does it automatically, but you should see what it, it doesn't do it very well. Not good it's yet. Like it's not what I'm saying at all. I didn't know if there was something better out there. No, the only thing better, I think, would be you typing it in yeah, again, yeah, right? What yeah, what's up? Um, yes, that they are, but if it's just screen capturing a lecture that students are able to attend, doesn't meet the requirement. Yes, I know I was relieved, right? I'm like, oh my goodness, I spent all this time on these videos and now I'm going to have to do them over. Yeah, not the case. Um, so I already told you about how I'm using Office OneNote. And I didn't have to do too much to change my lectures because I already had them in Word. So just copying and pasting and it worked well. Um, and then Camtasia, yeah, the only problem I had is that video files take up a lot of space. Um, and although I'm teaching multiple sections of the same course, I like to combine them in Angel so that I don't have to update something three times or link from an LOR three times. So I only have one gig of space. And my students, with the work that they submit throughout the semester, it normally takes up that entire one gig. I'm getting close to that already this semester. Um, so I had to put them in the Angel LOR. I didn't want to put them on YouTube um, because I'm using information from the textbook, from the author's textbook, so that needs to be copyright protected. Um, streaming.psu.edu also was very helpful because I could put unlimited numbers of files on there and then link to them. The only thing I like better about having it in um, the Angel LOR itself is that I can then link to that and uh, count how many students actually look at those files before they come to class, which is something I can't wait to share with you. So last fall was the first time that I actually had the lectures outside of class. Uh, and I told students, we're going to be flipping the classroom this semester. What do you think? And I got a lot of feedback. So they asked some questions like, what happens if we don't attend class? Um, we already had the conversation in this classroom about, is it online? Is it not online? Well, of course, it's not an online course. If it was an online course, I wouldn't be stuck going to a classroom and trying to get students to be engaged, right? That's the whole point of my life, though, is going to the classroom and engaging them. So no, it's not an online class. Uh. Um, other issues where students couldn't vid uh, view the videos, uh, they didn't download the software. They don't know how to download the software. Um, not quite sure how to get over that other than creating a screen capture of the process that you need to follow. But if they can't view the screen capture, then they can't view the directions. So that didn't work too well. Um, but then I just started referring them to the help desk, and everyone got clear on that. So after the first two weeks, everyone was fine. That was before the first exam. Um, one student said, you really want us to learn and do well. Thank you. And that has been carrying me the entire process. <laughs> uh, a couple students have issues because we're meeting in a lecture hall, so we need to use it to lecture in. 
All right, so I'd like to revamp all the lecture halls and make them like this, where you have desks and we can work together. That would be wonderful. I don't know if they're going to do that in forum building. Um, this next one is one that I'd like to spend a little bit of time with. I had this interesting discussion board post that just kept going and going and going because this student decided that when she sits in a classroom, that's the only time that she is available to get new content. And when she's outside of the classroom, she does not have that attention. She has a different type of attention, the one that I'm requiring during class where you're actually engaged. And that was the end of the story. That's where she she could not think outside of the box. And I really appreciated that she shared that with me, um, but the rest of the class then kind of tended to go away from her. So that didn't work too well. Um, I still don't know exactly how to address that other than open your mind. Just what are you going to do when you go to work? Are you just going to sit there and expect your boss to do your job for you, right? But I can't say that to them, so I didn't. Um, the next one, what happens if we have a question? People think I'm crazy because my syllabus does not have an email address. It has my office phone number. Even more crazy than that, my office phone transfers right to my cell phone. So if you call my office phone number right now, my cell phone and my backpack will be going off, although it's on silent. Um, I tell my students if they're watching the videos and they have a question, pause the video, call my office phone. If it's a convenient time for me, I will answer. I probably only have two or three students who do that. For some reason, they don't want to do that. They'll wait till they come to class or they'll post it on the discussion board. We also have very meaningful discussion board posts. Um, so that hasn't completely been too much of an issue. Um, the one feedback that I even just got in my office hour yesterday was I love being able to pause the videos, go back and watch them again before the exam. If there was something I didn't understand and then we went over it in class, then I go back to the video and I see it again and it makes sense. I mean, that's what this is all about, is uh, affording students who want to learn the opportunity to do so. So I eliminated two issues. Uh, in statistics, we go through things very fast. There's a lot of material, so students always complain that the pace is too fast. My past two semesters of SRT forms have not said that anymore, now that students can watch these videos. Um, the I need more examples, not a problem, because they watch the lectures outside of class, they come to class, and they get this whole class period more than once a week to do more examples. So the problem is now is how do I manage all this and how do I learn from all this? So now I have students saying, I need a tutor. I can't come to your office hours. What other help is available to me? Well, we do also have guided study groups, so I'm not sure what they're thinking. Oh, and all of the TAs office hours too, but I don't know. So I think the issue that I have now is a good one compared to the issues that I had before. Enough of this. I am talking way too much. So let's get into our origami lesson. What I was originally going to do is start the screen recording or screen capture now so that you could sit through what it's like for me to do this screen capture. And this size limitation is not making me happy. A zoom. I was just going to squish it some. Right, so that's going to work a little better for us. So imagine yourself not in a classroom. Imagine yourself at home or in a library watching this as a screen recording because this is what it feels like to be a student in a flipped classroom. You've logged on, you've accessed the file, you're ready to watch the presentation. So what you see up there is what you're going to see. Try not to look at me because you wouldn't see me yet. I'm not using the screen capture technology that also has a webcam in it because I hate what I look like. So. Uh, the history of origami, this was something that Callie and Jeremy did as an online source that I could steal from for free. So here's our history lesson. Uh, origami puts the two words together in Japanese, the word for folding and the word for paper. Um, normally, as students progress through the class, they know that what I normally highlight or talk extra about, that's something that you need to write down and document for the exam. Uh, as an educator for you, those are the points that I think are important for you to highlight so that they don't think that you're just reading from this. Don't just read from it. Highlight what you think is important, right? So this fill in the blank. Origami did not start in Japan. It began in... Well, where do you think it began? If you said China, you're right. Oh, no comments. Remember, you're watching this on your own. Oh, of course, maybe you're the kind of person who would talk out loud in the library and everyone looks at them, right? <laughs> so at first, there's very little paper available. So who do you think were the only people who had access to it, right? Just the rich. Uh, they used it as gift giving, good luck tokens, 
Uh, I thought this was really neat when you're celebrating weddings, they used origami. And as paper became less expensive, um, everybody seemed to adapt to that. Uh, super important, they were not wasteful. They saved even those tiniest pieces and used them again. Uh, origami was something that was passed on orally from generation to generation. Uh, so if you wanted to learn how to do it, you needed to be an active participant in the heritage or culture of your family. But then in 1797, we had this really famous book. Um, and the most important thing was that if you wanted to have a wish granted, you needed to fold 1,000 cranes. So how many of you have accomplished that yet as your bucket list? Anybody done that? <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Um, you don't have to bring them all to class, right? So there's a couple of things that you need to know if you're going to practice origami. And that would be your basic fold types. So we're going to go over some fold types. Uh, the basic fold, now we're going to test my drawing skills, right? Uh, you see the sheet of paper, and the outline is normally dark. And then where you make the fold is the dashed part. Uh, and so what you want to do is then fold the paper so it ends up looking like that once it's already folded. Now there are specific ways to fold this. You can either fold it over or under. So a valley fold is where when you unfold it, so it's going to start like this, you're going to fold it over so that it looks like that, right? Uh, when you unfold it then, let's see if I can do this. Here's where the fold is. It looks like this. So that's your V, valley fold. So that's folding kind of like on the top part. And it'll be a little easier when we go over this together in class. Uh, the mountain fold is when you do the opposite way. So you're going to take this piece and fold it under to get to that sheet of paper. And then when you unfold it, here's going to be the fold. Uh, I don't know if I can do this one. This one's more difficult. It looks like that. So it looks like an upside down V. Anyway. The problem that we are going to run into in class is that traditional origami uses a square piece of paper, right? But we're going to be stuck with these 9 by 11s or 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. So what you need to do is first fold your paper so that you've got this triangle going on and everything else over here is going to be your extra. And what you want to do then is fold your excess so this becomes your fold line. So this is your excess. If you mountain fold it and valley fold it and mountain fold it and valley fold it, uh, then you'll be able to then rip that off. And that's your excess. Don't throw it out. And then if you unfold that original triangle, you've got your square origami sheet of paper that you are ready to fold. So kudos to me. I'm done recording my assignments, so then I'll stop. So one of the questions that we had is, what does it feel like to be a student? Uh, in a flipped classroom, and it basically means you're going to be engaged. So what we're going to do now is this assignment. This would traditionally be homework. If you guys can take one and pass it, uh, excuse me, take a handful and pass it back so that the rest of the rows can then, well, you need some in the front yet. Here, we'll keep these in the front. Keep passing those back. Also, with the sheets of paper, please take one. If you want to just pass it all the rest of those back. This is the fun part. So right, your traditional lecture would happen, and then this would be the homework assignment. Now this is normally, I'm so glad this is happening. This is normally what happens in a classroom where you're flipping. You have to deal with extra noise. People passing pages around, people talking, people getting ready. Exactly. Now, if you had watched the lecture, you know that this sheet of paper that you just received is not going to be 
uh, the piece of paper that you want to fold your origami bookmark into. So if you remember what to do, you want to fold that sheet of paper. Do we have extras going around? Do we miss people in the back? Do we miss people in the back? Does anyone need a sheet of paper? Are there any more directions? Those of you at the table, can you share your directions and pass them back? So some of you are figuring this out on your own. The way to make the flipped classroom work is to encourage those students or guilt them into helping everybody else. If you figured it out and you teach it to somebody else, you're already studying for the exam because you've taught it to someone. Teaching someone how to do something is the best way to demonstrate your knowledge. If you're having trouble, you should be at this stage. Remember, you want to do the valley fold and the mountain fold and the valley fold and the mountain fold to get rid of that sheet of paper. <coughs> now, how many of you would like to see the students in your large classroom disengaged? Look around. Are you guys having fun? <laughs> Now, I see some people almost already done, and that's one of the issues to contend with, because in a large classroom, some students are going to be done in five minutes, and some students are going to take the entire class period to do that same amount of work. So your next steps, you've already got this basic fold, if you want to fold those sheets up, fold those sides up, as it says in the directions, but then you need to unfold them. Part of the mastery of origami is making creases effectively and then unmaking them. What I normally like to do in a classroom is walk around more, but getting into these rows is going to be difficult. Is anyone having issues completely lost, not sure what they should be doing? I'll take that as a sign that we can keep moving on. If you fold this next piece down, and then you want to tuck those pieces under. That was our mountain fold when you tuck those pieces under to get your bookmark. Like that. All right, because of the essence of time, I am going to say that if you haven't gotten to this point yet, and if you haven't made another five bookmarks out of the remaining sheet of paper, come see me at lunch, and I'll hit you over the head with this one, right? One other fun thing that you can do if you are done, let me see your, full, your finished bookmarks. They turn into great hats. Does anybody have a hat in the room? Come on. If you know you want to put it on. So that's what it feels like to be a student in a flipped classroom. I'd like to quickly go through the feedback that I have received. And this is where we're going to answer some of those questions. That is awesome. Can I borrow that for a second? <laughs> the creative use of some students, I don't know if you can use this as a bookmark when you're reading on a tablet, but it is very decorative. Thank you. OK, so check out this good news that I received. Dropout rates of my classes are no different than previous standards. Student complaints for 200 level statistics classes are no higher than usual. I received feedback from some professors. Uh, one of them was eternally grateful for that teaching method. Uh, another one told me that what I'm doing is not new. Anybody heard of the Socratic method? Right? Of course, you expect students to be prepared for class. How did we ever get away from that? We had a little bit of feedback of fears from students. Some of them said it forces them to keep up with the material. Bonus. 
Um, fitting their busy schedule. Do you guys have students in your class who have health problems? Students who have children that they need to watch? Uh, our students seem to be going through so many more crises than before, uh, family emergencies, but they can still keep up with the content. Um, the students that have trouble with this class are the ones who don't know how to be students. We kind of addressed that issue. What do I do to make sure that they know how to become a successful student? One of the first agenda items that I posted on ANGEL this semester was how to be a successful student. I told them that a successful student has a good notebook, right? So in their notebook, they need to have definitions, formulas, and examples. And if they come to me and say, I'm not doing good in this course, what am I doing wrong? I tell them the first thing I'm going to ask them is to see their notebook. What does your notebook look like? If it's a bunch of chicken scratch that doesn't have anything other than two pages full, then you know that that's a problem. So I'm setting students up with that at the beginning of class. Um, most of my students have access to that file. Are they really doing it? Well, the ones that are, I'm really impressed to see what their notebooks look like. And I think that that's going to be something that they're proud of as well. Um, some students think that I do still need to lecture at the beginning of class. So I might do that next semester. Um, and for most students, they know that it's different, but they want to make it work because they want to be successful. Some people want numbers to back this up. Now, this is the part where I might have a little bit of difficulty showing you. I've been giving the same exam for the past how many years? Um, it's a pool of questions. I uh, give my exams at the testing center. So the questions are randomly pulled for each student. So I have these comparisons. If you don't know too much about statistics, uh, the top is the maximum. Then we've got the 75th percentile, the 50th percentile, and the 25th percentile. And these asterisks at the bottom are outliers. Oh, that didn't show up well. Um, so it looks like... With these two classes, these are when I was flipping the classroom. This is when I recorded uh, the lectures during class and then posted them after. It looks like they did a little bit worse, right? A little bit worse. Um, but numbers aren't always what you think they are. If you look at enrollment for the course, uh, that's when we added a third section to STAT 250. So now we have students enrolling in the class. There's no longer a waiting list. So the types of students that are taking this class are a little bit different than before. I think that's why there's a difference there. I understand that I'm running out of time, but there are a few things that I would like to show you. Um, for example, this semester, this was the fl flipped classroom. Uh, these parts were where we saw the increase. Uh, grades got a little bit higher on the exams. And as the exams got harder and harder, um, here's our flipped classrooms. Excuse me, this one's flipped. This one was the recording, and this is everything else. So exam five, the hardest exam, the scores are better on the exams. And I think that was the nice thing for me to see. A uh, somewhat similar thing happened in STAT 200. I'm just going to flash by those, though. They will be posted on my blog. The one thing that I do want to address, oh my goodness, it was a whole lot more work for me. But I love going to class this semester. Uh, it's so much fun being, to, being able to engage with the students. Uh, it's also a little bit more work for them because they have to change the way that they think about things and they actually have to work in class. And if you think that's a bad thing, then I don't think you should be here at this symposium. I think you all would agree with me that that's what we want our students to do. So I have one more piece, and then I'll take your questions. Um, what do I want to do in the future? Like I said, I really want to just keep my job. Uh, we're getting a new department head, so I'm a little shaky on that one. Um, but I don't really like the clicker questions too much because students just come to class and press the button. I like what I'm doing in my 200 class better, so I think I want to switch to that overall sheet that they have to fill out. This way, the students who didn't watch the lectures, which I told you I'd tell you, Not what I wanted to see. 
Um, but my exam scores this semester are actually broken up into two groups. Uh, I did my thesis on mixture models where you've got these two groups merged together in one graph. Uh, I can see the grades for the groups that are doing what they should be doing and then the grades are lower for the group that is not doing what they should be doing. Um, eventually all of them watch them right before the exam. The night before the exam, the day of the exam, that's when I get the lecture activity, right? Um, and that one thing, like we said about grading, more than 200 papers once or twice a week, that's a lot of work. What I asked my TA to do is to look at the sheet of paper. If there's work written under every single question, they get full credit. If there's not, they get part credit. Done. Move on to the next one. So it does go pretty quickly. What are your questions for me? Because I think we're out of time. Yes. Um, I was just talking to someone at the University of Iowa where they're doing more interactive and they're actually, they've redesigned the whole suite of classrooms there to have the workstations because it gets away from that lecture perception. Mm -hmm. Do you, and their maximum size is about 100 students, do you think redesigning classrooms on a large scale like this would make it easier for you to get the message across that that's the expectation during class versus a standard lecture where everyone's facing forward? Yes and no. Um, I don't know if it would make it easier for me, but I know it would make it more beneficial for the students. And that would be my primary concern and my primary reason to do that. Uh, I think, you know, for monetary reasons, we stuff them all in a large classroom and we, do with, we deal with what we have. Um, but if there is a way to make it better for them, and that involves working together at a table, because I think that's more real life too. I think if a university wants to maintain its status as the future goes on, especially with more videos posted online, like the Khan Academy videos, uh, content is going to be everywhere. Everywhere. But if we can get them in a classroom and make them apply that content, that's what's going to give a university its name and its new reputation for the future. Does that answer your question? Yes? Those quizzes, can they work together or are they open book, open notes, open discussion? I have yet to have a student stand in the front of the class and say the answer to number one is this, the answer to number two is this. But I do have students who sit across the row and one of them completes it and then they pass it along and copy it. Those are the ones who fail the exam anyway, though, and it's such a low stakes. They get two out of a thousand points per assignment, so if they're going to be copying off of their classmates, they're going to have to make up for it somewhere else. Any alternative for that if you don't have TAs? <laughs> Honestly, do it yourself. I graded them myself the first semester I tried that, and although it took one to two hours, not to grade them, but to enter them in, you know, for each student to enter those grades in. If Angel was a little nicer, maybe there would be something quicker, like with an attendance grader, that type of thing, I definitely think it's worth it because it forces students to work together in class. Yes? I have considered um, having lecture quizzes that the students have to watch the lecture and before they come to class they take an angel quiz. Yes. And then it is just automatically. <laughs> that sounds good. I actually just had that idea from the presentation that I just attended before this one that, you know, if you're going to post these notes, I can make a PDF of this file and post it and that's what students want, but then they don't hear you talking through it. Right. If you make a quiz that says, what's the thinking behind this? Genius. Then they actually have to learn. Right. Yes? Um, I was in the public work in architecture. We are post-captioning all of our courses. Awesome. Uh, we use an automated service for that. We just send them the video files. They send them and they, what do they that. use? Uh, we use three point media. Okay. Um, and uh, one side effect of this that we found that I was worth mentioning is uh, students, especially if English isn't their first language, find the first half extremely useful. Oh, I'm sure. The thing I've been able to do is take all of those post-caption files and make a text 